Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you very much tonight. Thank you for what we've been learning. Thank you for the challenges, the encouragement, the instruction, the inspiration you've been giving us in the book of Jonah. We pray that tonight, once again, you challenge us and put your fire inside every one of us in Jesus' name. Open our eyes of understanding that we may see and behold wondrous things out of your word in Jesus' name. We bless your name because we know you have answered already. And we'll see the touch of the Lord in every one of our lives. In Jesus' name, we pray. We're back to the book of Jonah. And you might think we're going to chapter 3, but not quite. We're back in chapter 2. Today we want to see how to learn, how to pray from Jonah. The title of the message tonight is Learning How to Pray from Jonah and the Psalms. You might never have noticed this, that there is so much of the Psalms in Jonah's prayer in chapter 2. Jonah must have learned very much from the Psalms. Obviously, he was very familiar with the Psalms. Every part of Jonah's prayer can be traced back into the Psalms. For example, in verse 1, chapter 2, verse 1, you'll find similar things in Psalm 130, verses 1 and 2. Just write it down. Verse 2, you'll compare that with Psalm 18, verses 4 to 6. Verse 3, you'll compare that with Psalm 69, verses 1, 2, 14, and 15. Verse 4, you find verse 4, being compared to Psalm 31, verse 22, and Psalm 5, verse 7. Verse 5, you'll find that comparable to Psalm 124, verses 4, 5, and 8. Verse 6, that you'll find in Psalm 30, verse 3. Verse 7, you'll find that in Psalm 77, verses 3 and 7. Verse 8, you'll find something very near in Psalm 40, verses 11 and 12. Verse 9, you'll find that in Psalm 116, verses 17 and 18. And Psalm 3, verse 8. Verse 10, that you'll find in Psalm 33, verse 9. And Psalm 40, verse 2. As you go through the 10 verses of this chapter 2, you'll find very clearly that every verse has a comparable psalm, verse in the psalms, you can compare. By the way, as you look at this Jonah chapter 2, you know that Jonah had been thrown into the sea. And then the whale or the big fish had swallowed him up. And it was in that situation he began to pray. In chapter 2, verse 1, then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. And he said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord. And he heard me. And out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. And then he goes on and on until he comes to verse 8, when he said, They that observe blind vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed salvation is of the Lord. And when he had prayed like that in submission and consecration, the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Just look at one psalm. In Psalm 107. Psalm 107. Reading there from verse 6. 107 verse 6. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. Verse 7. And he led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city of habitation. In verse 10. Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron in verse 11 because they rebelled against the words of god and contempt despised the counsel of the most high 
uh, you can see the parallel between what you are reading and the experience of Jonah. In verse 14, he brought them out of darkness and a shadow of death and break their bands in sunder. In verse 19, then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble and he saved them out of their distresses. In verse 22, and let them sacrifice the sacrifice of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. Verse 27, they reel to and fro and staggered like drunken man, a drunken man, and at their wit's end. Do you even know that that expression is in the Bible? At their weed's end. And then in verse 28, Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. The last verse, verse 43, also is wise, and will observe these things. Even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. As you read that, you'll find a lot of similarities between Jonah chapter 2, where Jonah prayed, and uh, the Psalms. Believers who want to learn how to pray more fervently and more effectively can learn much from the Psalms. The Psalms cover all practical experiences of life and give encouragement as well as inspiration to pray. And the Psalms instill confidence in God's faithfulness and develop faith. Uh, to receive supernatural help and miraculous answers. Now we come to chapter 2 itself now. I will want to study more in depth. Uh, we're going to divide into three parts. Number one, the intensity of his supplication. The intensity of his supplication. Number two, the interpretation of his suffering. All that he went through, how did he, un how did he understand? How did he interpret the suffering? And then number three, instruction for halting soul winners instruction for halting soul winners let's uh, come to number one the intensity of his supplication please come to jonah chapter 2 verse 1 then jonah prayed unto the lord is god out of the fish's belly he waited too long before he prayed and yet even the very fact that he waited that long gives us some important things about prayer in verse 2 he said then i cried it is said i lifted up my voice because it was in that belly of the fish and was down below it just cried out because by reason of my affliction unto the lord and he heard me out of the belly of hell cried i you see how he described the situation he said i counted myself to have been in hell it was hell for me. Uh, you, you find some people, they use that language too. It says, he, they say, hell broke loose. It was so terrible. I never knew I could come out of it. It was almost like being in hell on earth. And then he said, and thou heardest my voice. You will see that he was fervent in prayer. And his fervency did not come out of habit. Out of tradition. There are some people, they are fervency in prayer. It's out of habit or tradition. They did that before. They always shake their body. They always jump up. They always look a particular direction. They always uh, bend. They always stretch. They always do a lot of things. They do gimmicks in prayer. But in Jonah's case, it wasn't like that at all. I'll show you just now what made him to have fervency in prayer. But uh, look at Psalm 25. In Psalm 25, reading from verse 16. Psalm 25, verse 16. Turn thee unto me, and have mercy upon me, for I am desolate and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. O oh, bring thou me out of my distresses. Look upon my affliction and my pain, and forgive all my sins. When, when you can describe your situation like that, and you're using what's like desolation, affliction, and trouble, and distresses, and then you come back and you talk about affliction and pain, and the problem of sin, then your fervency will not be a formalistic thing. It will not be like, you know, it's traditional. That's how he normally prays, and he prays and he sweats, but there's nothing to eat. He can come out of that prayer and be jesting and joking after that. You see, he had fervency in prayer because of the situation in which he found himself. First Samuel chapter 1 verse 10. First Samuel chapter 1 verse 10. And she, referring to Anna, was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept so. I think it's God's mercy 
that he sometimes even allows us to get into some distressing situations a painful situation we find ourselves and because of that situation we have no choice but to cry unto the lord and it wasn't uh, just for jonah not just for anna not just for a few people there are times that we as a church as we see the circumstances around us and the condition of the church we're even called to pray like that we're told in joel chapter 2 joel chapter 2 verse 17 let the priests the ministers of the lord weep between the porch and the altar let them say spare thy people O lord and give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen shall rule over them wherefore should they say among the people that is among the nations among the gentiles where is their god then will god be jealous for his land and pity his people we are called to that kind of prayer but uh, i told you i will tell you uh, what caused fervency in prayer for jonah and it was spontaneous there was no hypocrisy in this it was not a theatrical act that is it was not acting the part it was caused by number one the flame of passion the flame of passion and that flame of passion for him was caused by the feeling of pain the psalmist expressed it he said in my affliction and in my pain the feeling of pain caused the flame of passion for us it may not be the feeling of pain directly it may be the fire of persecution you're going through persecution you never expected that and it is so much on you it almost overwhelms you swallows you up almost overcoming you that fire of persecution will make you pray like you never prayed before number two the failure of all people you see all those mariners they tried to help him and they rode hard and they went hard but then there was no help and then they threw him up and there was nobody now if god did not save him that was the end for him because of the failure of people not only that you know in your life when you come to that situation that you know that this is not ordinary you are fighting against something and it's like you are fighting the principalities it makes you fervent in prayer that brings me to number three the fight or the principalities and powers and when you know that this is not a battle against the flesh against blood and you know that this is not what human beings this is a fight with principalities the realization of that will bring you to that fervency in prayer and do you know something he was shut up there he was abandoned there and there was nothing else he could do see no friend no discussion no joking nothing at all he knew that the only thing to do at this time is only to pray and if i don't pray i'm finished and uh, that made him to have number four the force of perseverance all those three days all those three nights that's it he had the force of perseverance and that led him to pray that way you'll pray that way too if you were in the storm you'll pray that way too if you if you see that uh, there is nobody to help you'll be crying out and praying master the tempest is raging the billows the billows are tossing high the sky is overshadowed with blackness no shelter or help is near carest thou not that i perish how canst thou lie asleep when each moment so madly is threatening a grave in the angry deep you know if uh, jonah knew that song that's exactly what he'll be saying he'll be saying master with anguish of my spirit i bow in my grief today the depths of my sad heart are troubled oh waking and save i pray torrents of sin and of anguish sweep over my sinking soul i perish i perish dear master oh hasten and take control and that's the passion he had that's the reason why he prayed with that force of perseverance but then you know number five the focus of purpose he had a purpose his only purpose he wasn't a person diverted here and there thinking about this you know there are people that pray and then they cannot concentrate their minds are wandering there is no central goal and central purpose and the thing they are aiming at in the prayer but this man he had only one purpose he had only one goal i want to come out of this place and when i come out of this place i'm going to do the will of god i'm going to preach in any the focus of purpose and of course number six he had faith in the promises he's still at hope he's said i look towards your temple i know you're angry with me 
I know you are not happy with me, and I know why, but I'm going to look towards your holy temple. Because of that, he was able to have that fervency of prayer, and the Lord answered that prayer, and the Lord will answer your prayer. How did the Lord answer the prayer? In verse 10, it says, And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited Jonah upon the dry land. Your troubles will give you up. Your problems will give you up. You become free again to do the will of God in Jesus' name. Number two, the interpretation of his suffering. Very many times uh, we misinterpret our situation. We misinterpret our suffering. And if we misinterpret, then we're not going to be able to have uh, the answer we ought to have. Look at it now from verse 3. For thou, underline that word thou, thou hast cast me into the deep and in the midst of the seas and the floods compassed about me all thy billows i know this is coming from you i know this is not satan satan is not interested in getting me consecrated and submissive and going to nineveh satan is not interested in running after me and getting me back to the center of the will of god i know that these billows and these waves and all the flood is aimed at getting me back to the center of the will of God for my life. I know it's your billows. I know the trouble is coming from you. And thy waves pass over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. Yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compass me about. Even to the soul. The depths closed me round about. And the weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottom of the mountains. And the earth with her bars was about me forever, yet has now brought me up my life from corruption, our Lord, my God. One thing we notice here is the source of his suffering. The source of his suffering. He said it himself, thou hast cast me into the deep. And then he referred to the billows, he said, thy billows. And then he referred to the waves, he said, thy waves. This thing came from the Lord. Many times, if we are disobedient to the word of the Lord, disregarding God's will for our lives the billows and the waves the troubles and the trials the pain may be orchestrated by the hand of the lord himself in psalm 32 psalm 32 reading from verse 4 and verse 5 it says for day and night thy hand was heavy upon me david knew it was the hand of the lord thy hand was heavy upon me my moisture is turned into the drought of summer it says sailor that means pause and think about it i acknowledge my sin unto thee and my iniquity have i not hid i said i will confess my transgression unto the lord and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin and it says sailor again think about it in uh, psalm 39 psalm 39 reading there in verse 8 deliver me from all my transgressions make not make me not the reproach of the foolish i was dumb and i opened not my mouth because thou didst it he said you did it i know you did it you know many times you misinterpret your suffering you misinterpret what is happening to you you do not know god has a hand in it remove thy stroke away from me i am consumed by the billow of that by the blow of thine hand and so you see there are times if you are running away from the preaching of the gospel the assignment that the lord has given you that the lord is saying hey, don't fight your brother don't fight your wife don't fight your husband don't fight your neighbors this thing is from me in first kings chapter 12 first kings chapter 12 verse 24 the problem here is that uh, rehoboam the son of uh, solomon wanted to fight against jeroboam because a part of the kingdom had been given to jeroboam and to rehoboam sorry to jeroboam and then eventually rehoboam the son of solomon in verse 23 he wanted to fight so that he'll be able to get everything back he said i will not have this and that in this kingdom and then in verse 24 the prophet spoke to him thus says the lord ye shall not go up and fight against your brethren the children of israel return every man to his house for this thing is from me he says rehoboam that problem you're having that trauma you are going through and the rebellion over there and the dividing of the kingdom and the thing and the thing you are thinking this is not all right this cannot be so this thing is from me and there are times in our lives when we need to realize like a jonah 
the source of our suffering. Number two, in that uh, section of interpretation, the scope of his suffering. We're back in Jonah chapter 2. The scope of his suffering. Uh, as you read uh, that passage, you'll find number one, it was physical, the suffering. Number two, it was emotional. Number three, it was spiritual. It came in all directions and it overwhelmed him. Uh, you know, sometimes when your, uh, you, when your problem is single track, it's coming from one direction, you brace up and you say, I can take it, I will endure it. And then God says, no, you will not take this one. This one is coming from all directions, physical emotional spiritual all to just put the pressure on you so that you can come back to the center of the will of god number three there is a scourge used in his suffering number one is a source god was a source himself number two the scope physical emotional spiritual number three the scourge used in his suffering as you read the passage, the Lord used the flood, he used the billows, he used the waves, he used the weeds, elements without human agent. Jonah didn't have anybody to accuse. He wouldn't be able to say, so-and-so might be doing this. I'm suspecting such and such. I'm suspecting this other one. God used all these elements without human agents. I come to number three. Instructions for halting soul winners. You know, that was the problem of uh, this man. He was halting. He wasn't doing what the Lord wanted him to do. He was being sidetracked from the work the Lord had called him into. And we have instructions here. He said in verse 7, Jonah chapter 2 verse 7, When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. He said, I remembered the Lord. I know what he wants. I'm not ignorant of his demand. I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. I see the problem. They that observe lying vanities, I lied to myself. I deceived myself. I cajoled myself. I just said, uh, I turned the blanket over myself and closed my eyes to reality. And eventually, it's like observing line vanities, forsake their own mercy. I forsook my own mercy, but I will sacrifice unto thee. With the voice of thanksgiving, I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Praise the Lord. I said, Praise the Lord. Uh, this man realized and he said now i remember and i'm going to keep on remembering the lord in uh, numbers chapter 15 when we remember the lord what do we remember of the lord do we just remember him in a sentimental way yes i remember the lord is a nice person is a forgiving god is a loving god with him all things are possible it's more than that numbers chapter 15 in numbers chapter 15 he has a kind of remembrance he wants but 39 it says and it shall be unto you for a fringe that ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord. That is it. That's what to remember about the Lord. It's not just, I remember the Lord. I remember this. I remember this. I remember his promises. I remember he's so nice. I remember he, he lost me and whatever I do, everything is so No, there's something else to remember. It says, I remember, you have to remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them that ye, that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which ye use to go a warning. Then in verse 40 it says that ye may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto the Lord your God. That's, the Lord want, that's what the Lord wants us to remember. When you see that you've gone astray, you've not been keeping the commandments of the Lord and then you are praying so that you'll be you, you'll get back to where you ought to be then you say I remember the Lord. I remember the commandment of the Lord. In Psalm 38 Psalm 38 I'm reading from verse 17 for I'm ready to halt and my sorrow is continually before me. For I will declare my iniquity, I'll be sorry for my sin. Eventually, this man said, I remember where I left it. I remember where I went astray. I remember what I should be doing. I remember the thing that I've abandoned and left behind. And I'm going to do just the will of God. Revelation chapter 2. Here, the Lord Jesus was talking to the church. And as the Lord was talking to that church, the Lord is talking to you too and talking to me. It says in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. It's calling us back to the responsibility he has given us as uh, children of God. There are three things to look at here. Number one, remember the Lord's commandment. 
remember the Lord's commandment. When this man Jonah, when he said, I remember the Lord, he said, I remember the commandments of the Lord. I remember uh, the, the reason and the source and uh, the, uh, the, the, the wherewithal of this uh, problem and the pain that comes upon me. Remember the commandment of the Lord. That's why as a believer, whenever you are sick or something unusual is happening to you, instead of just saying, just praying in general terms, you go back to God. Why is this happening to me? You look at the commandments of the Lord and the things the Lord is requesting from you. That's where I missed it. That's where I missed it. That's where I missed it. If I can go back and sacrifice again with the sacrifice of thanksgiving and then commit myself to paying my vows again, to renewing my consecration again, I know the Lord will answer. So, number one, remember the Lord's commandment and renew your consecration unto him. Number two, remember your first love and commitment. Remember your first love and commitment. The way you loved the Lord in the past, the way you loved dying souls in the past, and the way you loved the word of God in the past, you remember your first love and your commitment. What's that going to bring in you? You respond in the affection of Christ. Respond in the affection of Christ. Number three now is to remember the lost. Remember the lost and be concerned about them. Remember Nineveh. They're still there. And no other person has been sent there. Therefore, Jonah, when you say you remember the Lord, what do you mean? I remember his commandment. I remember the great commission. I remember my first love. I remember my first commitment. Not only that, I remember Nineveh. I know that's where my ministry is. I know that that is something I have to do. And I'm concerned for them. And so, Jonah, if you remember them, what are you going to do? I'm going to make up my mind now that I'm going to rescue them. And what are we making our minds up our minds to do? To rescue the perishing? To care for the dying, to snatch them, impeaching from death, from sin and the grave, to weep over the erring ones, to lift up the fallen, to tell them of Jesus, who is mighty to save. Though they are slighting him, still he's waiting. He's waiting the penitent child to receive. Plead with them earnestly. Go to that Nineveh and plead with them gently. He will forgive if they will repent and believe. Down in the human heart, crushed. By the tempter, feelings lie buried that grace can restore. Touched by loving hand and waking by kindness, cords that were broken will vibrate once more. Rescue the perishing. Duty demands it. Strength for thy labor the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently win them. Tell the poor wanderer, a savior has died. Will you do it? Rescue the perishing. Care for the dying. Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. Can you stand up? Will you rescue the perishing? You see, the source of the problem is that you abandoned evangelism. You abandoned the Great Commission. That's the source of the problem. Why don't you come back to the Lord? Instead of running here and there, I want deliverance. I want answers to my prayer. Just remember the Lord and remember the commission. Remember what the Lord is requesting from you. The demand of the Lord upon your life. Don't throw it aside. Don't throw it aside. The great commission. The great commission. The great commission.